all prophets from Adam alayhi salam till Isa alayhi salam came to guide their own people their scripture their book of guidance was meant only for their people what makes Muhammad so important sallallahu alayhi salam so the first time in human history comes with a message for entire mankind till eternity never given to anyone no prophet no messenger no guide before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam ever claimed it's a challenge it's an academic challenge no religious person before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam meaning may the peace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him ever claimed that I am for mankind as a messenger and my message is for entire mankind and it is till eternity that no message will come after this no messenger will come after me except Muhammad Sassam nobody said this Kul say tell them inform them inform whom not ya Arab not ya Bani Israel Kul ya Yuhannas O you mankind in me most certainly I am Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, Ilaikum, sent to all of you. The first man on earth to claim, I am a messenger from Almighty to all of you. I am a messenger to the Romans, to the Jews, to the Christians, to the Hindus, to the Buddhists to the Jains, to the Atheists, to the Agnostics, to the Persians, to the Greeks, to Americans, to Europeans, to Germans, to white supremacists, to the super caste and the upper caste, to the lower caste and the middle class, to every one of you, I am the messenger of Allah. A man whose face nobody saw whose voice nobody heard after him after Muhammad Sallam nobody heard his voice nobody saw his face 1450 years but we love him more than everybody on the face of the earth ready to die for him show me any other religious personality who has followers who revere that personality the way we sinful Muslims still love and do for him we agree with, we are sinners. We agree for every negative we have in us. But yet we love our Muhammad Islam more than anything on earth after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two billion Muslims are living on earth today. Two billion. We don't require an image of Muhammad Islam to love and die for him. We don't need it. He said no image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Millions of pasajid on earth, not a single masjid holds a photo of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You understand? His greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and astounding results are the three criteria to judge any human genius. Who can dare compare anyone with Muhammad? Philosopher, orator. Apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational dogmas, of a cult without any image. We have no image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of a cult without any image. The founder of 20 terrestrial empires and one spiritual empire. What is that one spiritual empire of the Muslim community? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah Muhammadun Rasulullah Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu I Simak Hussain Siddiqui a student of the IREF and academically a student of psychology shall be the master of conduct of this session being held 
at the IREF this afternoon on 12th February 2023 Sunday. Inshallah, we shall commence this privileged gathering with the recitation of a portion of the Holy Quran with its English translation. Inshallah, I now invite Sinan Hussain Siddiqui, then afterwards another student, Khari Abdul Khayyum, to recite and translate the recited portion respectively in English. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I, Sinan Hussain Siddiqui, a student of IIEF and a student of 10th class. Inshallah, I shall now recite Surah Ahzab, Surah number 33, Ayat number 21 and 22, and then translate the same in English. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْذَابَ قَالُوا قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهِ قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله وصدق الله ورسوله وما زادهم إلا إيمانا وتسليما. Translation: There has certainly been for you in the Messenger of Allah an excellent pattern for anyone whose hope is in Allah. And the last day, and who remembers Allah often. And when the believers saw the companies, they said, This is what Allah and His Messenger had promised us. And Allah and His Messenger spoke the truth, and it increased them only in faith and acceptance. Zagallah khair, wa akhiru dawan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillahi rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I, Abdul Qayyum bin Abdul Hafiz Muhammad, inshallah, I shall be reciting Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayat number 253, and Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayat number 81, with its English translation. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تلك الرسل فضلنا بعضهم على بعض منهم من كلم الله منهم من كلم الله ورفع بعضهم درجات وآتينا عيسى بن مريم البينات وأيدناه بروح القدس ولو شاء الله ما اقتتل الذين من بعدهم من بعد ما جاءتهم البينات ولكن اختلفوا فمنهم من آمن ومنهم من كفر ولو شاء الله ما اقتتلوا ولو شاء الله ما اقتتلوا ولكن الله ولكن الله يفعل ما يريد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ أخذ الله ميثاق النبيين لما آتيتكم من كتاب وحكمة ثم جاءكم رسول مصدق لما معكم 
مصدق لما معكم لا تؤمن به ولا تنصر قال أأقررتم وأخذتم على ذلكم إصري قالوا أقررنا قال فاشهدوا وأنا معكم من الشاهدين Translation In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Those messengers, some of them we caused to exceed others. Among them were those to whom Allah spoke, and He raised some of them in degree. And we gave Jesus, the son of Mary, clear proofs, and we supported him with the pure spirit, that is, Jibra'il. If Allah had willed, those generations succeeding them would not have fought each other, after the clear proofs had come to them, but they deferred, and some of them believed, and some of them disbelieved. And if Allah had willed, they would not have fought each other, but Allah does what He intends. And recall, O people of the scripture, when Allah took the covenant of the prophets, saying, Whatever I give you of the scripture and wisdom and then there comes to you a messenger confirming what is with you. You must believe in him and support him. Allah said, have you acknowledged and taken upon that my commitment? They said, we have acknowledged it. He said, then bear witness and I am with you among the witnesses. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. الحمد لله. All praises be to Allah alone. I shall introduce briefly the I R E F to all of you before inviting my father, that is Brother Imran, as he is popularly known for Mushtaba Hussain Sadiqi to deliver the main talk. الحمد لله. The I R E F, Islamic Research and Educational Foundation, was established in February 1998. as a full-time Islamic research-based educational foundation with my father, that is Brother Imran, as the founder-president of the IREF. The foremost purpose of the IREF is to invite Muslims and non-Muslims alike in the right perspective of Quran and Sunnah in the understanding and methodology of male and female companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah, for the same, The IREF has conducted several public talks followed by open question and answer session with Brother Imran as the main speaker of the most of the sessions. Interfaith and interreligious debates and dialogues with scholars of other religions were also a part of our academic approach to promote the mission of Islam. Brother Imran has hitherto traveled to more than 15 countries for Islamic talks and also travel extensively within India. Alhamdulillah, Brother Imran has delivered more than 500 public talks that are now uploaded on this official YouTube channel of the IREF. By subscribing at youtube.com slash IREF videos, you may also like our official Facebook page at facebook.com slash IREF POSTS. And by adding our official WhatsApp number, double nine eight nine zero three one three seven three on your mobile, kindly text your name and the name of the city of residence on the WhatsApp number so that we may add you for updates. Alhamdulillah, my mother Nida is a homemaker and is the first wife of Brother Imran, while my co-mother, that is Brother Imran's second wife, Sister Amtul Mateen, in these days conducting exclusive session. for women on Sunday mornings, while on Sunday afternoon, Brother Imran conducts sessions for both men and women. Along with my father, my younger brothers and I also give brief talks on Islam and comparative religion. Inshallah, I now invite Brother Imran to commence the session, entitled as What Makes Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So Important? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم 
ولی وصحب ہی اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم قل یا ایوہ الناس انی رسول اللہ علیکم جمیعا اما بعد ربش رحلی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل الاغدت من لسانی یفقہ خولی ریسپیکٹڈ برادرز اینڈ آل مائی ڈیئر سسٹرز آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلامک گریٹنگس السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میننگ مے دا پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگس آف اللہ سبحانہ و تعالی بی آن آل آف یو دا سبجیکٹ آف دس آفٹرنون اسٹاک از واٹ میکس محمد موسٹ امپورٹنٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم میننگ مے دا پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگس of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him. Now, we all know as Muslims, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the most important personality on earth after Allah rabbul alameen for every Muslim. We love Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after Allah the most. Meaning, in comparison to the love for our mother, for our father, for every other family member and for every other living creature on earth for us Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is more important than any other creation of Allah after the creator Allah himself that is our faith our belief without which I am not a Muslim as Allah's messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself in a narration recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari he made it very clear None of you can be Muslims. None of you can be true Muslims. Unless your love for me is beyond the love for every other creation on earth. So that is very clear. Now, this part, what makes Muhammad Wasallam so important? So, to understand that, we need to understand some basic history of human beings. With the atheist community, with the community that refers to itself scientific community meaning a community that only believes in reasoning in logic in evidences in science in technology for them entire universe was created without a creator there is no creator and the universe got created by itself and everything in the universe got created by itself and that itself is so illogical statement and that itself has always been spoken without any evidence to back that statement when we discuss with them the last they go to is everything in the universe was a nebula and then from that nebula from that small point the whole universe came into being by itself and when you pose a question to them from where did that nebula come they have no answer to it so this is one section of the society that does not believe in God, that does not believe in religion, that does not believe in messengers of God. And then you have another section of human beings. I am talking not just of our time, I am talking from the time the very first human being put his foot or put her foot on the face of the earth. Then there are others who believe that the creator every now and then would visit the earth in human form so that he could one reason they give for the incarnation of God, for the God visiting the earth is that God after creating his creation, one of the loveliest creation being human beings, the God thought the best way to educate human beings about the do's and the don'ts in their life is by himself becoming a human being. So God incarnated in the human form, became a human being himself and he started to realize the pains, the pleasures the human beings have and based on that, God when he was on earth, he gave dictations. He gave oral dictations to the people of his time which became guidelines for the people to live after the God who incarnated died as an incarnated God in the human flesh. So this is one another set of belief that many people believed since human beings put their foot on earth after an evolution of human history they started to believe this then there is another set of people who believe that God 
cannot take any human form. Instead of that, God selects, chooses from human beings some of them to become his prophets, his messengers, his ambassadors to convey what the Almighty wants his creation to do and what the Almighty doesn't want his creation to do. So God himself, he doesn't incarnate. God instead selects from amongst the human beings people as prophets and messengers. Prophets is an English translation for the Arabic word Nabi or Ambiya. Nabi is singular meaning prophet. Ambiya is plural meaning prophets. And messenger is the English word which is a translation for the Arabic word Rasul. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to Islam as is believed by some people especially by the Abrahamic faiths. What are Abrahamic faiths? So popularly today we are taught that the people who believe in Ibrahim alayhi salam to be a prophet of God and the people after him who believe in him and his children to be prophets of God are Abrahamic faiths. So the most popular of all the Abrahamic faiths you have Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Judaism is the religion of the Jews, Yehudi and Christianity is the religion of the Christians the Nasara or the Isai and Islam is of course the religion that we Muslims adhere to and we attest our belief to Islam. So now based on this basic concept of the history of human beings related to understanding Almighty the Creator and the purpose of life these are some basic concepts that we have and then you have another set of group of people and the set of people amongst the human beings who say there were some good people who started to get enlightenment through their meditations and then through their meditations whatever they felt was good to the people they guided them and they neither rejected God nor they believed that there is a God so even these were a set of people now amongst this history of human evolution when I say evolution, please do not get me wrong. I am not talking about Darwin's theory of evolution. I am talking about the history of the evolution of human psychology and beliefs related to Almighty and the religions. So based on this, if you understand, when we as Muslims talk about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam, we are very clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam can never be equaled with any creation. There is no one equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also believe Allah will never take the form of any creation. We also believe that Allah selects, chooses from human beings at different points of time some people or a human being or a man and appoints that person as his prophet or his messenger. And of all the messengers and all the prophets in Islam that Allah chose, all of them were men. Allah made it clear in one of the ayat in the Quran that Allah made men as the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also respected and gave the reverence to certain women in the Quran, raising them to be revered by the people afterwards equal to the prophets. For example, Maryam alayhi salam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him. Like we take the name of any prophet and we suffix a praise saying alayhi salam, meaning may peace be upon him. For example, Musa alayhi salam, Dawood alayhi salam. Similarly, when we take the name of Maryam, we still say alayhi salam, the same reverence and respect we give even to her. But for the job of the prophets, for the job of the messengers, Allah only chose men, not the women. Now this is the Islamic belief. In this belief, further, we also believe that the first human being on earth was Adam, may peace be upon him. And with us, the Jews and the Christians also have the same belief. The Jews... The Christians, the Muslims, together they believe that human beings 
were not evolved from apes from monkeys we didn't become human beings but rather god almighty allah created adam alayhi salam as the first human being and he sent adam alayhi salam on earth as the first human being to put his foot on the earth and along with adam alayhi salam his spouse eve as mentioned in the bible in the book of genesis and hawa alayhi salam as mentioned in the ahadith by muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so the complete incident about adam alayhi salam is mentioned in several places in the quran to read it for the first time it's in surah baqara surah number 2 ayat number 30 to ayat number 38 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about creating adam alayhi salam and deciding to send him on earth as the one who will manage the affairs of the earth for a period of time now this is our belief straight forward then we believe that after adam alayhi salam till nuh alayhi salam the people who came they practiced monotheism meaning they all believed allah is only one just before nuh alayhi salam according to ibn abbas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu's narration in one of the narration ibn abbas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he mentioned that from adam alayhi salam after adam alayhi salam for 1000 years the people were purely monotheistic purely muwahhidin purely believing in allah as allah willed then slowly shirk started association with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started to appear in the people till finally in after 2 to 3000 years after adam alayhi salam shirk started to be a part of the life of human beings and when all this started allah rabbul alamin started to select people at the time of adam alayhi salam he made adam alayhi salam his prophet then prophets came even after adam alayhi salam in detail allah did not give chronologically the name and the time period of them in the quran neither did muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam mention their time period and their chronological order in any of the authentic hadith of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam except that we get about 25 names of those prophets and messengers in the quran and a few of them from the ahadith of muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so based on this what our understanding is when allah started the creation sent adam alayhi salam on earth chose him to be the first prophet then he appointed nuh alayhi salam to be the first rasul the first messenger the communication of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the prophets and the messengers was as allah mentioned that it does not befit allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to directly talk to somebody except with a screening and musa alayhi salam was one of them whom allah spoke directly in his own voice with a screen but for others allah would send jibril alayhi salam to communicate the commands of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to these prophets and messengers and then these prophets and messengers after receiving the commands of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would communicate the same to the people of their time and the people of their place as to what are the commands of allah about the do's and the don'ts that was how allah selected prophets and the messengers till allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testified in the quran in surah ahzab surah number 33 ayat number 40 that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been made at the final of all the prophets and the messengers when he read surah ahzab surah number 33 ayat number 40 allah said muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the seal of the prophets khataman nabiyin he is at the ikhtitam at the finish of all the prophets of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so prophethood began with adam alaihi salam messengerhood began with nu alaihi salam and it ended with muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the quran in surah baqara surah number 2 ayat number 213 that when we timely kept sending our prophets to the people to guide them in the matters in which they disputed we also revealed our books to these prophets so that with our books they may guide the people by name allah mentioned four books the tawra the injil as mentioned in al imran surah number 3 the zabur as mentioned in surah bani israil surah number 17 ayat number 55 and the quran as mentioned in surah baqara surah number 2 ayat number 185 now with all this said what is very important for all of us to understand is 
that when Allah sent prophets before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when Allah sent messengers before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, all the prophets and messengers who came before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam were sent only for their community and for a time period, a fixed time period. And the message they brought was also only for their people and for a fixed time period. You understand? For example, Musa alayhi salam was given the Torah. So with Torah, whom is he supposed to guide? We all know Musa alayhi salam is from the progeny of Ishaq alayhi salam, Isaac as mentioned in the Bible, who was the second son of Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam is from the progeny of Ishaq alayhi salam. But we also know that Ibrahim alayhi salam had an elder son. Ishaq alayhi salam had an elder brother, a co-brother. Co-brother meaning the mother of his elder brother was different. That was Ismail alayhi salam. Ismail alayhi salam was the elder brother of Ishaq alayhi salam born to the second wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, Hajar alayhi salam. And Ishaq alayhi salam was born to the first wife, Sarah alayhi salam. But from the second wife, Ibrahim alayhi salam had the elder son. From the first wife, he had the younger son. From Ishaq alayhi salam, you have a son by the name Yaqub alayhi salam, who is mentioned as Jacob in the Bible. So you see Jews, Christians, Muslims together are on the same platform when it comes to believing in Ishaq alayhi salam and his son Yaqub alayhi salam. Then Yaqub alayhi salam, he had 12 sons. How many? 12. All these 12 sons are known as children of Israel in the Bible. Jews, Christians, Muslims agree that the 12 sons of Jacob are the children of Israel. This term children of Israel in Arabic, children of becomes Bani. Israel remains Israel. Bani Israel. Why Israel there? So we all know in the book of Genesis chapter number 37, when you read the Bible, the Old Testament, the Jews and the Christians, they say, book of Genesis chapter number 37, Jacob, Yaqub alayhi salam, was given a title by Almighty God as Israel. Israel is a Hebrew word, a combination of two words. Isra, it means the slave. El, it means Ilah. Slave of Ilah, slave of Allah. Abdullah in Arabic. So Israel is a Hebrew word which is an English, which is a Hebrew translation for Arabic Abdullah. So Israel was the title given by Almighty Allah to Jacob. The same is testified by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when you read Surah Baqarah, Surah number two. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Tafsir ibn Kaseer, he says that Bani Israel means children of Israel, and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam asks a rhetoric question to the Sahaba. He asks them, "Who is Israel?" And they say, "Ya Rasulullah, Allah and His Messenger know the best." Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam replies, and he says, "Who else except?" Yaqub alayhi salam. Meaning, again, Jews, Christians, Muslims are on the same platform to believe that Yaqub alayhi salam had the title Israel. His 12 sons become Bani, Bani Israel, which is children of Israel in the Bible, Bani Israel in the Quran. The third son is Levi. You have the Levi genes today. The Levi. From the Levi, the progeny of Levi was considered by all those children of Israel as the most pious of all those 12. You understand? There were 12 sons for Yaqub alayhi salam. Of them they considered Levi to be the most righteous and pious. So the remaining 11 brothers for any religious ceremony, they would visit Levi and they would say, pray for us. Make dua for us. Blow the dua upon us. For anything religious, they would visit Levi and ask him the fatwas. And from his progeny, always they gave preference to the progeny of Levi. And from the progeny of Levi, according to the Bible, in the fourth generation is Musa alayhi salam. You understand till here? Though we don't agree with that fourth and the third and the fifth generation, but we, we as Muslims agree that Musa alayhi salam belonged to one of the children of Yaqub alayhi salam. So that was Musa alayhi salam. Now Musa alayhi salam received Torah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you read Surah 
Araf Surah number 7, ayat number 142, ayat number 150. Allah in detail mentions about Musa alayhi salam receiving Torah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How was the Torah given to him? On tablets. Meaning on slates. It was handed over to Musa alayhi salam. So this is what the Christians believe, what the Jews believe, what we Muslims also believe. That Musa alayhi salam received Torah. What was Torah? So the Jews and the Christians, they said it had 10 basic commandments. 10 fundamental commandments. For example, what are the five pillars of Islam? So you immediately count Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 8, Shahada, Salah, Psalm, Zakat and Hajj. But are these only the commandments? No, no, no. They are fundamental commandments. They are the fundamentals and obligations in Islam. They are the pillars of Islam. Similarly, tablets had 10 commandments and other message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those 10 commandments were given to Musa alayhi salam to preach to whom? To preach to the children of Bani Israel. Now what does children of Bani Israel mean? From each son, each son would have given birth to many children. So all those children, now they may be in thousands in number. There were 12. By the time Musa alayhi salam came, their number grew into thousands. So these were Bani Israel for whom Allah appointed Musa alayhi salam and ordered Musa alayhi salam to guide all the children who were from the progeny of those 12 children of Yaqub alayhi salam. But Torah was not given for entire humanity. It was only for Bani Israel. What happened after Musa alayhi salam died? Because there was no concept of memorization of Torah like we have huffaz e quran Memorization of Quran. That concept was not there at the time of Musa alayhi salam for Torah. So after a long period of time, they divided themselves into sects. Who divided themselves? The Jews. And the Levites, they took an upper hand to say, it is only our duty to read and explain the Torah to you that was given to Musa alayhi salam. What happened after that? It became inaccessible to the common other children of Bani Israel. So the common other people in the progeny of Bani Israel, now they lost the access to Torah. Who had the copyright of Torah with them? Only the, the Levites. You see similar, you have other places also where you have this caste system and the upper caste. It has taken the copyright saying that only we can read and explain to you religious scriptures. The same happened with the same happened with Bani Israel. Who took the charge? The Levites. So they made the common people only as audience to listen whatever they were reading. And because there were no memorizers of the Torah, so nobody in the audience exactly knew whether they were reading Torah or they were adding their own words to it. And whatever explanation they would give, the common masses agreed to it. And that blind acceptance is still we find everywhere in the world today. Even in the Muslim community, if they have some Maulana Murshid or a Mufti, he says anything even if it contradicts Quran and Hadith, blindly the people accept it. You got my point? Even though the Quran is intact, still we have blind followers. Still we have Mukhaladeen. For them, it was very easy. There was no access to the original word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Torah, to the common amongst the Bani Israel. So now whatever their religious leaders they said, the common masses agreed to it. You are understanding this point? This is very important. What happened after that? When this started to happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept on sending other prophets to correct wherever they made changes in the original Torah. The prophets would come and they would say, no, this is not correct. This was not there in the Torah of Musa. Allah is revealing to us, this is there in the Torah. And this kept on happening. Till Allah sent Dawud salam with Zabur. Dawud salam also came to follow Torah. Zabur was not a separate law. Zabur was only a book given to him to read out to the people and correct them in the matters where they changed the original Torah given to Musa salam. And Dawud is also from the progeny of those, one of those 12 children of 
Yaqub alayhi salam. From the children of Israel. From the Bani Israel. Then after Daud alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, Baitul Muqaddas was constructed. All this, I don't want to go into that history. I'm just giving a brief introduction for you to come to the conclusion when I'm going to talk about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So now came Isa alayhi salam. You understand my point? After Musa alayhi salam, they were waiting for a Messiah to come. Who? The Bani Israel. Why? Because for them it was told in the Torah that there will be a messenger who will come after me and he will guide you into everything. So they were waiting and they were waiting and they were waiting. When Allah sent Isa alayhi salam, he was born miraculously without any male intervention. He didn't have a father. He was born without a father. As Allah said in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, when you read, Allah said, the similitude of Isa alayhi salam in the sight of Allah is just like Adam alayhi salam. For as Allah created Adam with dust, so did he create Jesus Christ with dust. So if Allah can create Adam alayhi salam without mother and a father, for Allah to create Isa alayhi salam only without a father is not any big deal. So Isa alayhi salam was born there. He was born to Mother Mary. Mother Mary is from the progeny of Harun alayhi salam. This we can guarantee that she is from the progeny of Harun alayhi salam. From the children of Harun alayhi salam. Who is Harun alayhi salam? Surah Taha, Surah Shaura, all these surahs when you read the brother of Musa alayhi salam about for whom Musa alayhi salam himself made dua. He said, Ya Allah, I am a stammerer. When I talk, I stammer. Give me a brother. Give me a messenger, a supporter who can speak to Firaun fluently. Whatever you reveal to me, I will tell him and he will speak fluently to Firaun to give dawa. So Allah appointed Harun alayhi salam, his brother, to become his supporter. So from Harun alayhi salam's progeny is Maryam alayhi salam. How do we know this? So in Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, when you read from so, ayat number 26 onwards they say Ya Ukhta Haruna oh you sister of Harun alayhi salam so Ukhta Ukhti it means sister Ukhta means sister but Ukhta also means Aki and Ukhta also means from the progeny of oh you from the progeny of Harun alayhi salam so it is confirmed in the Quran that she was from the children of Harun alayhi salam so again Maryam alayhi salam is from the Bani Israel and now came Isa alayhi salam. His first miracle mentioned in the Quran, Surah Maryam, Surah number 19, ayat number 27 to ayat number 31. When you read Isa alayhi salam, when she comes back to her people after giving birth to Isa alayhi salam, see a little background to this. Maryam alayhi salam, when she became pregnant, Allah said, Oh Maryam, leave the place where you are living with the people. Go to an isolated place. It is upon Allah to take care about you. Then she, she conceived the baby for nine months in an isolated place. She delivered Isa alayhi salam. She was returning. Allah gave a sign. Allah said, when you return, if the people ask you anything about this baby, because they know you are not married, you are a virgin, they may ask you a question, how did this child come to you? How did you give birth without marrying any man? So when they ask this question, you just point to the baby as if you are asking them that the baby shall answer them. So she does the same thing. That is mentioned in Surah Maryam. At number 26 to at number 31. She points to the baby. They are... Amazed, they say, what Maryam? How can this child speak? He, he is just born, you are carrying in your arms, the baby is coming in the arms and you want us to ask him? The moment they say this, Isa alayhi salam speaks. That's his first miracle. He says, I am the messenger of Allah, I am the Rasul of Allah. Allah has taught me Injil and the Torah. You see, now he receives Injil also. Allah taught me Injil and the Torah. Got my point? So now Isa alayhi salam got Injil. And now what does Isa alayhi salam do? He speaks to the people and he tries to correct them in the issues which they changed in the Torah after Musa alayhi salam. Also confirmed from the Bible. When you read Gospel of Matthew chapter number 5 verse number 17 to verse number 20 Jesus Christ may peace be upon me in the Bible also says New Testament the same thing. He says do not think that I have come to destroy the Torah or the prophets before me. I have not come to destroy them meaning. I have not come to make them invalid. I have not come to tell you that they are not prophets. Don't follow them. Do not think that I have come to destroy the prophets. 
or the law. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. Fulfill what? Fulfill the Torah that you people changed after Musa I have come for that. So that was his mission. So you see what happened? This is human nature again. What happened is when he said this, those religious heads from the Mani Israel, you understand religious heads? For our better understanding, we are all Urdu speaking people. Those Maulanas of the time, those Muftis of the time, those Alims of the time, the misguided Alims of the time, what did they say? They said, this person, this Isa is a fake Messiah. He is not the messenger. We are not going to accept him. And they went to the Roman king, the Roman administration. Why the Roman administration? Again, a bit of history. Palestine and Jerusalem that you talk of today, this place was ruled by Romans when Isa a.s. was born there. When Isa a.s. was born, who was ruling that place? The Romans were ruling. What was the religion of the Romans? The Romans were not Jews. They can't be Christians because Isa a.s. came in their midst. What were they? They were idol worshippers. They worshipped idols. You got my point? They were idol worshippers. The Jews used to live under the Romans. And what was the agreement between the Jews and the Romans? What was the agreement between Jews who are monotheistic? Who actually should worship only Allah? These people and believing in the prophets. What was their agreement with the idol worshipping Romans? Their agreement was that in our personal laws we will follow our scripture. In criminal laws we will follow the Roman law. You understand? Roman law in criminal laws. Personal laws according to our scripture and our religious muftis and maulanas. Whom they referred as rabbi. They call the maulanas and the muftis as rabbi. We will follow our rabbis. How to marry? The rabbi will come and instruct us how to marry. How to bury our dead? The rabbi will come and instruct. How to pray in the synagogue? The rabbi will come and instruct. So these rabbis... They went to the Roman administration and they said that Jesus Christ, Isa is a, is a person who is instigating us to rebel against Roman Empire. He is provoking us. He is provoking us. So they instigated him. Till a case was filed against FIR was booked. In our terminology to understand, FIR was booked against Isa a.s. He was pulled into the court and the court said, put him on the cross to die. That is the actual story that happened. When they wanted to put him on the cross, Allah made it clear in the Quran, Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayat number 157 to 159, Allah raised him up alive. They could not put him on the cross. But unfortunately, the Jews and the Christians today, they believe the Jews... For them it was very important to make sure that everybody believed that they made sure that Jesus died on the cross. The Christians unfortunately later purchased the story sold by the Jews that he was killed on the cross. And till date they believe in the same story. You got my point? So now Isa a.s. is lifted up alive. But again in the entire part what have we understood? Now we understood that the Jews living at the time of Isa a.s had already changed the Torah that was given as Sharia, as law to Musa a.s. to be followed by by whose community? By whole community? By Bani Israel. All of you are understanding? Only Bani Israel were not living on earth at that time. You understand? Romans were living now. But Torah was not for the Romans. Zabur was not for the Romans. There were Persians also. So, Torah, Zabur and Injil was not made a law by Allah for Persians, Romans and any other civilization on earth at that time. There was Egyptian civilization, Chinese civilization, Indian civilization, Babylonian civilization, Mesopotamian civilization. Then you had the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, all of them were there on the planet earth. But Taurah was sent only for? Who is Bani Israel? 
the 12 sons of Yaqub alayhi salam and they are the great grandchildren of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Right or wrong? So they were all those children. Another beauty Muhammad alayhi salam informed us. He said after Ishaq alayhi salam till Isa alayhi salam. From Ishaq alayhi salam till Allah selected prophets and sent prophets only in Bani Israel. Only in meaning from the children of Ismail alayhi salam no prophet came. Ismail alayhi salam Ishaq alayhi salam are living in the same time. One is an elder brother, one is an younger brother. From the children of Ismail alayhi salam no prophet and messenger is coming at all. All prophets, all messengers are coming from till Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. You got my point? From Ismail alayhi salam? Every prophet that came here, every prophet that came from Bani Israel, from the children of Israel, they said, a messenger will come after us. Who will come? A Messiah will come after us. They were prophesying whom? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Every one of them was saying, you see, every Nabi had their Sahaba. Musa alayhi salam, for him there were Sahaba. He told his Sahaba, see, even if people change the Torah after me, remember, Allah will send a Messiah to correct it. A messenger will come. Injil, Zabur, Dawud alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, they are informing, see, a messenger will come, a messenger will come, a messenger will come. Constant prophecies. We all know, Torah is not in its original form. We all know, Zabur, which they refer as the book of Psalms, is not in its original form. We all know, in the entire Bible, there is no Injil Isa, there is no gospel of Jesus. What they say is, whatever Isa salam spoke was written after him, inspired to four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And we all know that Christian scholars themselves have come out with so many mistakes in the existing Holy Bible. According to Awake magazine, 8 September 1957, it says that there are at least 50,000 errors in the Bible at that time. Because of those errors, what they had to do? They had to keep on revising, keep on revising their religious scripture. Why revising? So they, their scholars would sit, their experts would sit and they will try to filter and take out whatever other people added in the book and said this is from God. So they have been doing this job. For centuries they have been doing this job. You agree? You understand? Why, why is this so much trouble they have to take for all this? Simple. Because the original tablets of Musa salam are no more there. And there was nobody half is a Torah, half is a Zabur and half is a Injil. There was no memorizer of the Torah. There was no memorizer of the Zabur. There was no memorizer of the Injil. So now every now and then with Generations passing whenever and then everybody is not accessed to the scripture. Today when they are saying, the Christian scholars are telling us, we have 40,000 original manuscripts from the community of the same Christian scholars, from their own batch mates. We have honest Christian scholars informing the world that yes, we have 40,000 original manuscripts, but none of them is same. They are all different from each other. So the, there are in other words 40,000 originals. Each original is different from another original. You got my point? See this is very important for us to understand. So no memorizer of Torah. No memorizer of Zabur. No memorizer of Injil. And if you look around the world at that time. There were idol worshippers in many places in the world. They were also following some scriptures. But none of them had memorized their scriptures at that time. None of them. So, scriptures and understanding the scriptures, believing the scriptures, totally it was a copyright of a particular upper caste of every religious section. Every religion had caste system. Every religion had groups. The upper caste group 
held to the religious scripture saying whatever we say you have to follow that is what Muhammad Sassam said in that popular hadith the Jews divided themselves into 71 sects the Christians into 72 the Muslims will divide into 73 you understand sects each sect before the Muslims about the Muslims let us discuss at the end if time permits me but before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the problem with each sect was of the Jews they had only one sect which was the upper caste whatever they said everybody had to follow blind following happened because the scripture in its original form doesn't exist all of you are understanding this perfectly then messengers and prophets are coming only from the progeny of every prophet and messenger is informing about the coming of a so now this bible it is so much changed yet Allah said in Quran in Surah Araf Surah number 7 ayat number 157 Allah said my messenger who is an unlettered prophet unlettered meaning who does not know how to read and write is mentioned in their scriptures you got my point so the beauty and miracle of the Quran is even after so many revisions to this book with so many times alterations modifications and corrections yet prophecies of Muhammad Sassam are intact there when you read book of Deuteronomy chapter number 18 verse number 18 book of Isaiah chapter number 29 verse number 12 songs of Solomon chapter number 5 verse number 16 when you read the original songs of Solomon chapter number 5 verse number 16 the name Muhammad appears there Muhammad sallallahu Muhammadim Hikko mami takim vi kullo muhammadim sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Then when you read the New Testament, Gospel of John chapter number 15 verse number 26, Gospel of John chapter number 16 verse number 12, 13 and 14. I am just giving references because now my topic is not about the prophecies of Muhammad Sassam in other scriptures. I am just trying to show still his prophecy is mentioned that he will come. But now when you meet these people, the upper caste of their society who have taken the copyright to explain the message when you meet them they have still kept their people misguided saying this is not for Muhammad Sassam we are waiting for that Messiah is still to come got my point so we say the Messiah already came to you you rejected that Messiah only because of your ego that Allah has been sending prophets from the children of Isaac why should Allah send a prophet from the children of Ismail that ego became the biggest reason to deny Muhammad ego came you see human ego is very dangerous you know honor killings happen in India honor killings have you not witnessed in recent times also up to recent times previous history of India it indicates how upper caste people they oppressed the lower caste people to the extent that they treated them worse than animals domesticated animals why? ego I am the chosen one I am the one who is purest who is the best you see that ego so that ego made them deny Muhammad Sassam when he came you got my point? so the denial came basically because of Egoism. Further, when you read Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, Allah says that these people, they worship their rabbis and their priests. Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, we have not come across a Jew who worships a rabbi. Rabbi, you understand who is a rabbi? Whom you refer, Alim, Maulana, mufti azam They call him a rabbi. So Allah is saying they worship their rabbis and their priests. So the Sahaba innocently asked Ya Rasulullah, if we don't find any Jew or a Christian worshipping their rabbis and their priests, their religious heads. So Muhammad Sassam said, when their rabbis, their religious heads tell them something, they blindly follow it even if it is going against the message of Allah. So following anything against the message of Allah, Allah considers it worshipping that you understand 
following anything other than what Allah has dictated and commanded in the sight of Allah you are worshipping it so Allah testified to this now these people from the Bani Israel to this context it is very clear then as I said there were people who didn't believe in Ibrahim Romans Greeks Persians Indians Egyptians they didn't believe what about them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran in Surah Rod, Surah number 13, Ayat number 7, Wali kulli khomin had. To every people we sent a guide. Guide? Every messenger is a guide. Every prophet is a guide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A guide in historical places when you go, he tells you about that monument, gives the entire history, talks to you about what is it. A guide of Allah, he guides you to the path of Jannat to save you from, from Jahannam. Got my point? So guide, we send guide to every people, every people. What does every mean? Everybody on earth. In Surah Nahal, Surah number 16, Ayat number 36, Allah says, Kulli ummatir rasul. To every community, to every generation, to every people on earth, to every nation on earth, we sent a messenger. Allah said in Surah Fatir, Surah number 35, Ayat number 24, Wa immin illa khalafiha nazir. There is not a single community, not a single nation to whom a warner was not sent. In the Quran, Allah did not specify and say, to Romans we sent this messenger or a prophet. He didn't specify to say, to Indians we sent him. To Egyptians we sent him. In the Quran, Allah did not specify about messengers and prophets sent to other places on earth. But testified we sent to them. Why must Allah do this? Very simple. The first address of the Quran is to a people who are around Muhammad Sallam believing in Jesus, Moses and there are idol worshippers in Makkah who believed in Ibrahim salam, but they were idol worshippers. Why? Because the idols they instilled in Kaaba, they instilled the statues, they made statues and idols of the good people from the followers of Ibrahim salam, instilled them in Kaaba and would venerate them, make them intermediaries, make them during their duas as shafat karne wale. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah said I commanded them to directly make dua to me they made intermediaries by themselves they are kafir Allah said surah zumar surah number 39 ayat number 3 Allah said when it was said to them make dua to Allah purely they said we only call upon these idols so that they bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah said they are doing kufr you see address to Muhammad Islam is for the people around him instantly. But the message is being told to him that it is only not you and people around you to whom we send our prophets and messengers. Every people we have been sending. For Bani Israel, all the prophets and messengers came to guide whom? Right. Bani Israel. So if Allah sent a messenger to Egypt to guide the people in Egypt, to India to guide the people in India of that time, whatever Taurah, Zabur and Injil that was brought, it was changed all other scriptures were also changed because memorization was not a concept there now all this history is from what time? till Isa alayhi salam and we all know inna lillahi wa inna ilahi all came from Allah, all will return to Allah already said Qiyamah is going to be established, meaning like you have life, this universe is also having life and it will be given death. Kullu man alayha faan. Everything will die. Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You got my point? Our life, see, compare the life of a bacteria to our life. Few hours, a fly, maybe few days. A mosquito, maybe few days. Some other creation for few months. Cats and dogs, few years. So compared to our life, their life is? Our life compared to the universe life is very small. But the bacteria may be wondering that for the life of bacteria, 
compared to the life of bacteria with our life the bacteria may be thinking oh they are living for millions of years human beings you got my point it's living only for few minutes few hours living 60 100 years then Nuh alayhi salam 950 years bacteria of the time of Nuh alayhi salam oh millions of years old Nuh alayhi salam for the bacteria relatively you got my point for us this universe is billions of years old makes no difference kullu man alahafan we will give death to everything 60 years 100 years for you million and billion years for the sun and the moon and the universe but they will get death right or wrong so in this time period all prophets from Adam alayhi salam till Isa alayhi salam came to guide their own people their scripture their book of guidance was meant only for their people what makes Muhammad so important sallallahu alayhi salam so the first time in human history comes with a message for entire mankind till eternity never given to anyone no prophet, no messenger, no guide before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam ever claimed. It's a challenge. It's an academic challenge. No religious person before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam, meaning may the peace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him, ever claimed that I am for mankind as a messenger and my message is for entire mankind and it is till eternity that no message will come after this no messenger will come after me except Muhammad Sassam nobody said this I started my talk with Surah Araf Surah number 7 Ayat number 158 Kul say tell them inform them inform whom not Ya Arab not Ya Bani Israel Qul, Ya Yuhannas, O you mankind, Inni, most certainly I am, Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah, Ilaikum, sent to all of you. The first man on earth to claim, I am a messenger from Almighty, to all of you. I am a messenger to the Romans, to the Jews, to the Christians, to the Hindus, to the Buddhists, to the Jains, to the Atheists, to the Agnostics, to the Persians, to the Greeks, to Americans, to Europeans, to Germans, to white supremacists, to the super caste and the upper caste, to the lower caste and the middle class, to every one of you, I am the messenger of Allah first time ever and trust me 1450 years have passed since he for the first time may have uttered this message in this 1450 years after him not a single man stood up to make the same claim again not a single man the only man on earth is Muhammad Sallam who made this claim I am a messenger to all of you for what purpose to guide you. Guide you with what? With the message of Allah, the Quran, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lessened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduced the burden upon Muhammad sallallahu and his ummah of protecting this message. Because Allah said, don't worry, protection is in my hands now. Protection of this message, Surah Hijr, Surah number 15, Ayat number 9. Allah made it clear inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun most certainly it is we who reveal the message most certainly we will protect it surah fussilat surah number 41 ayat number 42 Allah said falsehood cannot approach it from front or from behind neither from the right nor from the left batil jhoot like you changed previous scriptures None of you, it's a challenge. None of you can change it. I am going to protect it. So, this Ummat of Muhammad Sallam and Muhammad Sallam himself was reduced with the burden of protecting this message, right or wrong? And the responsibility given was only convey it to others who do not know about it.
to guide them and not to guide them again it's in my hand your job is only convey fazakkir in nama anta muzakkir lasta alayhim bi musaitir surah ghashiya surah number 88 ayat number 21 22 oh mama sasam your job is to convey the message you are not made the manager of their affairs surah zariyat surah number 51 ayat number 55 remind them with the message those who believe the reminder from you oh mama sasam will benefit the believers so our job is only communication now when i said when i claimed that the quran is testifying allah sent prophets and messengers to other places also how can i justify the claim by saying that prophets came to other places and muhammad sallam is informing every prophet who came before me always informed them that i am going to come every prophet anywhere he was sent on the face of the earth informed about the coming of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so now when i read other scriptures for example there was a non muslim writer by the name dr ved prakash upadhyay a hindu brother who wrote a book about the prophecies of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in indian scriptures so for india vedas upanishads puranas these are considered to be the scriptures followed by those people who are indians so when you read rigved this is rigved when you read rigved book number 1 there are so many places muhammad sallam has been prophesied again as i told you my topic today is not about the prophecies of muhammad sallam and i also agree that every jew every christian every hindu brother every non muslim has a right to academically disagree with me he has all the right she has all the right to academically disagree that what you are saying is not right but what i studied from the book of dr ved prakash upadhyay i understand that what he has written being a non muslim he has said that there are prophecies of muhammad sallam in several places in indian scriptures when you read rigveda book number 1 hymn number 13 verse number 3 rigveda book number 1 hymn number 18 verse number 9 rigveda book number 1 hymn number 106 verse number 4 Rigveda book number 1 hymn number 142 verse number 3 Rigveda book number 2 hymn number 3 verse number 2 Rigveda book number 5 hymn number 5 verse number 2 Rigveda book number 7 hymn number 2 verse number 2 Rigveda book number 10 hymn number 64 verse number 3 Rigveda book number 10 hymn number 182 verse number 2 when you read yajurved chapter number 20 verse number 37 yajurved chapter number 20 verse number 57 yajurved chapter number 28 verse number 2 yajurved chapter number 28 verse number 19 yajurved chapter number 28 verse number 42 all these places it talks about a person narashansa by the name narashansa by a title narashansa nar and shansa are a combination of two words nar it means a man shansa is from prashansa meaning praiseworthy prashansa translated into english would mean praiseworthy narashansa translated into english it means the praiseworthy man and the praiseworthy man this phrase the praiseworthy man is the english translation of the sanskrit word narashansa now the praiseworthy man if i translate into arabic it is muhammad the name muhammad it means the praiseworthy man in sanskrit the translation of the name muhammad would be narashansa similarly when you read samved book number 2 hymn number 2 verse number 152 again muhammad sallam is mentioned there when you read atharved book number 20 hymn number 127 verse number 1 to verse number 3 Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned there when you read bhavishya puran adhyay 3 parv 3 khand 3 shloka number 5 to shloka number 7 adhyay 3 parv 3 khand 3 shloka number 10 to shloka number 27 muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned there when you read bhagavata purana book number 12 hymn number 2 verse number 18 to verse number 20 muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned there when you read the kalki purana chapter number 2 verse number 4 verse number 5 verse number 7 verse number 11 verse number 14 and verse number 15 muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned there so you see how come it is there so we say the prophets allah had sent to these places as muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam made it very clear every prophet prophesied about my coming and as i said every prophet that came before they came only for their people and why would they prophesy about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because all prophets are receiving a message from allah and allah is informing everyone 
that you see we are limited with our message only to you for a time period but allah for you and your progeny will send a messenger who will come for all humanity with a message for all humanity till eternity that is muhammadur rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam what is the importance what makes muhammadism the imp so important what makes muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so important every prophet prophesying about him he being muhammad sallam being the first of all the prophets and the messengers he is last in the list first of all of them to say i am a messenger for everyone till eternity and i have been given a message till eternity to guide mankind surah baqara surah number 2 ayat number 185 شهر رمضان الذي انزل فيه القران هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان رمضان is the month in which the quran was revealed as a guide to entire humanity and as a criteria to judge between right and wrong and as guidance surah furqan surah number 25 ayat number 1 glory be to the one who sent upon his servant a revelation so that with this revelation he was the entire mankind so what makes muhammad sallam so important that he is first human being on earth and the only till date to declare that i am a messenger to entire humanity and till eternity and my message is for entire humanity to guide them and till eternity moreover as i said allah does not want the people to blindly believe in whatever allah said allah wants them to reason if they don't want to believe allah says okay reason before denying allah and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah says reason give a reason why are you denying what can be the basic reasons they give no 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 this quran muhammad sallallahu wrote himself so historically this allegation doesn't stand 40 years he lived with the people today bbc and encyclopedia britannica agree that all historical records prove that muhammad sallam did not know how to read and write allah says in surah ankabut surah number 29 ayat number 48 wama kunta tatlu min qablihi min kitabin wala taqutuhu bi yaminik o muhammad sallam you never recited a book before this nor were you able to write anything with your right hand in that case the talkers of vanity may have doubted you wrote the quran allah made it clear allah gave the reason why allah kept muhammad sallam unlettered that had you been a person who knew how to read and write they would have doubted you wrote the quran still they disagree allah said in surah bani israel surah number 17 ayat number 88 surah hud surah number 11 ayat number 13 surah yunus surah number 10 ayat number 38 Tur surah number fifty-two in surah Bakra surah number two ayat number twenty-three and twenty-four Allah said still if they think you wrote it okay tell them to gather all human beings all jinnat all aliens all except Allah gather and try to produce a Quran like this try to produce one surah somewhere similar to the surah of the Quran fourteen hundred fifty years this challenge is standing. nobody has passed it attempted but the when they attempted their own people made a laugh at them <laughs> what a funny comic you people have produced thinking that you are challenge you are fulfilling the challenge of the quran it was rejected by their own community when they tried to do it 40 50 years what can be the other allegation no maybe some devil inspired muhammad sallam to write this not possible because in surah nahl surah number 16 ayat number 98 and 99 it says whenever you want to recite the quran seek allah's protection against the devil if the devil is revealing it why will the devil say seek allah's protection against me nauz billah auz billah min ash shaitan ir rajim auz billah min ash shaitan ir rajim it is obligatory to recite before reading quran auz billah min ash shaitan ir rajim i seek the protection of allah from devil got my point so it cannot be from the devil if they say 
he was mad nows billa nows billa so the science doesn't agree to it the science says if a person is mentally retarded he can't write a book for 23 long years without a contradiction in it impossible science doesn't agree to it only the fools can agree to it the medical science doesn't agree and allah gave a challenge for that surah nisa surah number 4 ayat number 82 afala yatadabbaruna alquran do you people not read this quran with care read its translations with care walau kana min indi ghairillah la wajadu fi ikhtilafan kasira had this quran been from anyone besides allah there would have been contradictions and mistakes it's a challenge come out so the one fellow his name is abdullah fadi or something he came up 500 contradictions in the quran and that fellow didn't realize that he was bringing out contradictions from the translations not from the arabic of the quran what is the difference this arabic is purely the kalam of allah subhanahu wa taala not a single alphabet forget a statement you understand what is a statement i am going to school is a statement i is an alphabet there alphabet one single alphabet forget the statement not even a single alphabet is the word of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself every alphabet is verbatim word of allah subhanahu wa taala 100% verbatim word of allah subhanahu wa taala what muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said recorded in other books quran intact to be 100% word of allah subhanahu wa taala the oldest available written format of the quran preserved in birmingham university with the latest research done and the people who done who have done the radiocarbon dating they have agreed based on the scientific research the oldest script of the quran preserved in a non muslim country till date in uk in birmingham city they say the radiocarbon dating it indicated that copy is hardly that was written between 13 to 20 years after the death of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when they for past 7 years they found out from the past 7 years none of them have come out to say the muslims that they have the quran in their home this is different from what we have with us in our birmingham university not even for an alphabet they have come out forget a word and a statement what makes muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so important he left a scripture to be preserved so perfectly by his ummah though the ummah have decayed in every good action that we were supposed to do as muslims even after that deterioration and that decay that we have fallen down to stand up as good muslims yet the quran is perfectly preserved and even after so many fault lines and so many faults and sins and so many negatives that the people can point out in this ummah yet even after that this ummah managed to have in the present time 200 million memorizers of the quran present in the world you burn away all the copies of the quran 200 million times at one single go we can print it back again and this cannot happen to any other scripture on earth it cannot happen to any other scripture on earth except the quran what makes muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so important a man whose face nobody saw whose voice nobody heard after him after muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam nobody heard his voice nobody saw his face 14 50 years but we love him more than everybody on the face of the earth ready to die for him show me any other religious personality who has followers who revere that personality the way we sinful muslims still love and do for him we agree we, we are sinners we agree for every negative we have in us but yet we love our muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam more than anything on earth after allah subhanahu wa taala what makes him so important his teachings that he has left are so perfect the quran said aqimu salah establish salah how to establish he taught us you know if you join the best most disciplined organization on earth anywhere you know what is it 
the army armies of every country are the most disciplined organization in that country discipline i am saying they will have to learn for months and years attention stand at ease right or wrong how to salute how to walk once he said when you are standing in salah shoulder to shoulder feet to feet no training everybody is there in seconds they are in millions circumambulating the kaaba azan is called they adjust so perfectly even the best and most disciplined organization on earth they get amazed at that training this is what makes mohammed sasan the most important on earth show me someone else he said you cannot sacrifice an animal except by saying bismillah allahu akbar no muslim can dare to do it after that he said no swine no pork no way no alcohol the least community that imbibes alcohol on earth are fortunately from the muslims but the muslims are the maximum teetotalers on whose dictate on whose command on the dictate of muhammad sasam from the quran ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu innamal khamru wal maisiru wal ansabu wal azlamu rijsum min amali shaitan surah maida ayat number 90 surah number 5 oh you muslims intoxication of all types gambling the astrology and idol worshiping are the worst things of the satan do not approach near it so that you prosper we held to it we have not drawn a single picture of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam yes some stupids may have tried to do it nobody accepts it but every community has black sheep we also have salman rushdie and taslima nasreens but 2 billion muslims are living on earth today 2 billion we don't require an image of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to love and die for him we don't need it he said no image of allah subhanahu wa taala millions of masajid on earth not a single masjid holds a photo of allah subhanahu wa taala you understand one man revolutionized billions to live after him billions to live after him one man has revolutionized which never happened before him you agree you disagree you may have made mythological figures with your pressure and force today to become historical figures you may have venerated somebody by praising them on your own agreed come on let's sit down with all the guidelines they have given and let us sit down with what muhammad sallam left as guidance to mankind you know why allah himself told muhammad sallam in surah khasas surah number 28 allah said say to them if they can get something better than this i will be the first to obey and follow it it's an open challenge reasoning allah says get something better than this you know meet the experts of economy and ask them why is there such a huge gap between the rich and the poor you know latest oxfam university's research for india 1% indians hold more than 50% of the wealth of india how many only 1% why this gap only 1% rich in the world hold more than 50% of the world's wealth why this huge gap ask economic experts they will tell you this is because of interest economy the one who is lending on interest keeps on lending on interest and keeps on increasing his wealth without he involving into any risk and you after taking loans on interest even for the needs of your life you are squeezed to pay money to him who is freely sitting to eat from what you have worked hard for where is the solution surah baqara surah number 2 ayat number 275 to 279 especially ayat number 279 ask them to take a notice of war against allah and muhammad sallam if they indulge in interest economy 
the worst of all the diseases on earth are said to be the STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. The World Health Organization agrees that the least affected community with STDs are the Muslims. Why? Because one man told us. See, our Momo Sazam said, the latest research is in Africa, which is a poor country, compared to any other continent, the most uneducated, backward in education, backward in economy are the Africans. A survey was done between Christian community and Muslim community in African continent to find out how many of them are affected with AIDS and between other communities and they found out least affected community since AIDS was discovered since then in the entire world the least affected community are the Muslims. Why? Muhammad Sassam, he condemned through Quran and Ahadith Zina illegal intercourse, having sexual intercourse, sexual relation except with the wife. Surah Bani Israel, Surah number 17, Ayat number 31, 32 La takharbu zina, do not go near zina. Least affected community. Why is he so important? Because anything he teaches is reasonable. And if I keep on speaking about him, if I die, then my son stands to speak, he dies. Then his son stands to speak and he dies. And his son and his daughter and his son and his daughter we keep. Every one of us keep 24 into 7 speaking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We cannot still justify his praise. We can't. The people who disagree, yes, they have a right to disagree. They have a right to disagree. But don't blindly, let's sit down, let's discuss, let's find out what makes you a person not to believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You tell us, you know history books are written today. In schools we are taught history, right or wrong? In schools we are taught history, in colleges we are taught, you may do masters in history, you may do PhD in history, and every history book it talks about so many civilizations, their rise and their downfall, their rise and their downfall. But when they talk about Romans, when they talk about Persians, Roman civilization, Persian civilization, rise and the downfall. Why did it happen? Why did this happen? They never talk about Bahamas Sallam and his Sahaba. They conquering these two great empires who were existing for two to three thousand years and a people who had no history of warfare, no comparison, conquering simultaneously within a period of six months two top empires of the world collapse. Yes, the blame can be. You know, they spread it with sword. They captured, they spread Islam with sword. Man, I agree, if they spread with sword, why did their generations stick after that to Islam? You know, when Russia, after Second World War, when Russia captured the Muslim countries in Europe, the Ottoman Caliphate, it was abolished in 1924 March, then after that, USSR, what you call today Russia, was actually Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So many countries together. Of them, 13 were Muslim countries that they captured. And from 1931 till 1991, they made sure that nobody reads Quran in public. No dawah is done, no Islam is propagated. In all those 13 countries, they made sure with an iron hand to crush and curb everything related to Islam. Right? And then 1992, those 13 countries, they declare freedom from Russia. All of them, they say we are Muslim countries again. This happens when you do something by force, the next generation will not accept it. But when Muslims captured Romans and Persians, Till date, 14, 50 years, they are proud to say we are Muslims. This cannot happen by force. Impossible to happen by force. History doesn't agree. Wahiduddin Khan, he received in 2021 January. Now it's 2023, right? Just two years back. 2021 January, Wahiduddin Khan by our Indian government was considered to be a very secular and a very knowledgeable scholar. 
and he was given by our present government the second highest civilian award in india the padma vibhushan award bharat ratna is the number one civilian award the second is padma vibhushan for his services for he being a moderate muslim scholar speaking against terrorism they appreciated him gave him the second highest civilian award so now according to you he is a very great scholar so this great scholar wahiduddin khan who received the second highest civilian award he wrote a book muhammad a prophet for all humanity he writes 80 wars or 80 conflicts or rather 80 times in the life of muhammad sallam muslim army went in opposition to the non muslim army or the enemies 80 times on the battlefield now you gave him padma vibhushan award he is quoting a history to say 80 times in the life of muhammad sallam they came face to face who muslims versus non muslims and he says historically in less than 20 out of 89 less than 20 times actually war happened 80 times they came less than 20 times the war happened and in the less than 20 times that the war happened in the life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam 259 muslims were killed 759 non muslims were killed total death toll in the entire 23 years of the life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the wars he fought was only 1052 or 1018 or something got the point only this much then according to another historical record muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself out of those less than 20 Muhammad Sallam participated only in nine. In his lifetime, eighty times two armies came face to face. Actual fight happened in less than twenty times. Muhammad Sallam himself participated nine times. How many killed? Two hundred and eighteen non-Muslims. Two hundred and sixteen non-Muslims killed in those nine wars. One thirty-eight Muslims killed in the nine wars. With the sword of Muhammad Sallam. only one only one killed in gospel of matthew chapter number 10 jesus is saying think not do not think do not be in the misconception what misconception that i have come to spread peace on earth i have not come to spread peace i have come to spread sword but even today when non muslims want to give a reference to peace this is buddha and jesus buddha and jesus buddha and jesus where directly he is saying i have come to spread sword and what about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who with all the power is capturing makka has all the power to kill all those people who forced him and his believers to migrate out of makka and his companions are very angry are very satisfied and happy now that we have got the time to take the revenge we are going to throw the flesh of our enemies enemies in the air and they are giving a slogan just about to enter makkah they say al yawma yawmul malhama today is the day to throw the flesh of the flesh of the enemies in the air the prophet stops them and says wait 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 we are about to enter makkah remember al yawma yawmul barhama today is the day to give mercy and forgiveness to all of them what makes muhammad most important a man who was troubled for 13 years suffered for 13 years he was bleeded by them his companions tortured his most beloved wife dies because of the suffering khadija radhiyallahu ta'ala anha he is entering with all force he would have crushed the enemies and he is saying no you will not touch a single one of them and he declares that whoever enters the house of the stone chest of my enemy abu sufyan will get peace from us i was giving a talk in kentucky in the united united states 
at Fort Knox to the American army. I told them, show me one single constitution on the face of the earth today. Show me one single constitution on the face of the earth today. Or one religious scripture, it will increase my knowledge. If there is any religious scripture, please show it to me. Except the Quran, which is giving an instruction to the Muslim army and commanding them that even if you are on the battlefield and if your enemy comes in front of you and I gave them an example gave whom an example? the American army I gave them an example and I told you once you go to Afghanistan if Bin Laden comes in front of you he kills your friends he rapes your women your sister your daughter your friends your colleagues and suddenly point blank in front of you now you put the gun on his head he has lost all his ammunition and weapons. He is without any arms. He is helpless. Point blank on your gun's range. And now he says, please give me peace. What will you do? What will you do? Human reaction will blow him into pieces. They said. I said, you see, Muhammad Sallallahu is most important because he gave a message through the Quran, Surah Tawbah, Ayat number 6, that on the battlefield, if you meet your enemy asking you for peace, take them to a place of protection, read the message to them, maybe they will understand it now. What does it mean? If I am fighting for Allah, as what is called jihad, by the misrepresentative media, and the enemies of Islam in their connotation today, if I am doing that, my religious scripture Quran and my Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, no personal revenge. Even if I find during the battlefield an enemy of Islam who raped my daughters and my wife, kill them then kill my parents now suddenly they are point blank on my guns range if they say peace Allah says no personal revenge take them to a place of protection read this message to them man show me one man who can say this except the messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can be truly the one who actually wants his creation to know him and to obey him rather than kill them what makes Muhammad Sassam so important? Show me one personality, one religious personality on earth who ever said in any scripture that if you save one human, you have saved humanity. If you kill one innocent human, it is equal to killing a whole humanity. It is Muhammad Sassam who informed us through Surah Maida, Surah number 5, Ayat number 32. You kill one single innocent man in the sight of Allah, you will be punished for killing whole humanity. You save one innocent man, you will be rewarded for saving whole humanity. And in the words of Lamartine, in 1854 when he wrote the book, Histori Dila Tarqui, describing Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 1854, no petrodollars. Arabs are not rich. Muslims not in a position at that time to bribe somebody to write good about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ottoman Caliphate has become very weak. They were already taking loans on interest from the Jewish community of the Europe. From the bankers of Europe. So Muslims are very weak everywhere. 1854, British are ruling India. Right or wrong? So Muslims are weak in India. When I say India of 1854, it includes Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, very weak. Indonesia, Malaysia, nothing. Nothing at that time. Middle East, nothing. They are already being ruled by the British. At that time, Lamartine is writing, a French. What is he writing? He is writing to say about Muhammad Islam, if greatness of purpose smallness of means and astounding results are the three criteria to judge any human genius who can dare compare anyone with Muhammad can you compare anyone in that aspect greatness of purpose you see what is the greatness of purpose I already told you first man in the children of Adam salam, and he will always remain the only man in the children of Adam salam, to say I came to change whole humanity Nobody said that before. Nobody said after him till date. Came with a message. 
Set till eternity. Gave a challenge. Nobody can change it. 14, 50 years. Every time it has been tried. Every time they tried, they utterly failed, shamelessly failed. Greatness of purpose. He is not saying I have come only for Bani Israel. He is not saying I have come for only the Egyptians. He is not saying I have come only for the Arabs. He is not saying I have come for the Chinese. He is saying for entire humanity I have been sent. To guide them, to change them. Greatness of purpose. Smallness of means. The Prophet Wasallam, when he died, on the day of his death, and since three days before that, in his house, in the house of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he does not have enough food to eat and no oil to lit the lamp. So his wife Aisha Raziallahu Ta'ala Anna has to take from her neighbors oil to lit the lamp and had one dry date from dip it in the water from one side she would suck it to suffice her hunger Muhammad Sallallahu is sucking it from the other side to suffice his hunger and he is already the uncrowned king of entire Arabian Peninsula and he is already the army leader who has dispatched a unit of army to conquer Rome and Persia who who has dispatched to conquer whom Imagine Nepal dispatching a unit of army to conquer China and America. It looks a joke. And who is sending an army? A person who does not have enough food to eat only on the date. He is about to die now. Sallallahu alayhi wa Greatness of purpose. You see what is his purpose? Romans and the Persians. Come on worship Allah otherwise we are sending the army to you. Greatness of purpose. Smallness of means, one dry date. Astounding results. From the time of his death to the next 30 years, Muslims are calling Azan near Paris, France and on the other side in Indonesia crossing India. Astounding results. Show any other religious person on earth except Muslim who did this. Or made this to happen. Are three criterias to judge. Any human genius we may well ask. Is there anyone who can be compared with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa A rhetoric question. Then he gives a, another detail. Page number 154. He continues. He says. Philosopher. Orator. Apostle. Legislator. Warrior. Conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational dogmas, of a cult without any image. We have no image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of a cult without any image. The founder of 20 terrestrial empires and one spiritual empire. What is that one spiritual empire of the Muslim community? La ilaha illallah Muhammad. All of you are making duas for the people who died in Turkey all of you feel sad yes. are you sure yes. but then you never asked whether they were Salafis or Deobandis or Hanafis how come one spiritual empire united us la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah the founder of 20 terrestrial empire and one spiritual empire in regard to all standards in regard to all standards by which any human greatness may be measured. We may well ask, is there anyone greater than Muhammad? No. Michael Hart, he writes a book, The Hundred, a ranking of the most influential men in history. He is a Christian. He is still alive. He is in the USA. He writes in 1973 the book, Muslims are still weak. 1967 to 73 is just five years. 67 a shameless defeat to the Arabs by Israel in the six day war entire Middle East is engulfed in the problem of Israel and Palestine Arabs are looking very very weak Muslim world very weak an American is writing a book the hundred 
a ranking of the most influential persons in the history of humanity and for everyone he gives a history of that person and based on the influence they had on human beings he grades them being a christian he puts acha another thing he includes in it scientists albert einstein newton edison he includes historians he includes dictators he also included adolf hitler he includes leaders every type of person since adam al islam he has put top 100 jesus christ third place muhammad rasulullah first place and you know he gives the reason he gives the reason in the book on page number 33 i would directly write like to read the book his reason from the book itself number 1 my choice of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular levels he is not a muslim nobody bribed him and then there is something called the christian science monitor you heard about it it's more popularly known as the monitor it's a newspaper it's something on the social media that's there so they keep writing different articles on different religions but primary aim is to promote christianity on 9th of december 2002 an article by alexander cronimer was published on it Alexander Cronimer it was published in Washington 9th December what happened one year before that almost September 11 9/11 2001 after that muslims were being targeted rise in islamophobia and those who were the enemies of islam in the usa they tried their level best to project that it is because of quran and muhammadism these muslims are doing this so in that background this article was written what is the name of the article understanding muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam not by a muslim now i would like to read some excerpts from that article he quotes pat robertson who is pat robertson pat robertson is an american media mogul religious broadcaster political commentator former presidential candidate and former southern baptist minister who advocates a conservative christian ideology and is known for his past activities in republican party politics he runs the cbn television which stands for christian broadcasting network by the name the 700 club who runs it pat robinson see Pat Robinson, this history I have put on the paper. It's not there in the article. Just to show who is Pat Robinson. So he's a very influential fellow. Pat Robinson has taken issue with the President, Mr. Bush, recently. Meaning, this article is written in December 2022. So Alexander, who is writing the article, he says recently this fellow, Pat Rob Robinson, he took an issue with President, Mr. Bush, reaffirmed his belief. Who reaffirmed that? President Bush reaffirmed his belief that Islam is a peaceful religion that has a welcomed place among the other faiths practiced in America in rejecting the president's word Pat Robertson and other Christian leaders once again are asserting that Muslims are dangerous Islam is fundamentally warlike and that Muhammad was primarily a military leader sallallahu alaihi wasallam now spill line zalik got it so he is trying to influence president bush saying that what are you saying mr bush you are saying islam is a peaceful religion no 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 this is the truth about islam so these assertions of course tap into the fears of many americans as one of the co producers of the new documentary airing on december 18 so this was written on 9 december a documentary by alexander was supposed to be aired on the christian monitor so the name of the document was muhammad legacy of a prophet 
In that he says, I have become well acquainted. Who? The writer. The presenter, Alexander. He says, I have become well acquainted with the story of Muhammad and believe that the program will shed light on a debate that is currently generating only heat. Meaning, what is the debate? Muhammad Sallam is the person responsible for terrorism on earth. And another group, no, no, no. Islam is a peaceful religion. Now he is reasoning something very beautiful there. He says, all religious scripture is subject to interpretations. Every religious scripture can be interpreted. Therefore, all can be misused. If somebody misinterprets something from a religious scripture, even Bible can be misinterpreted and misused. Even Vedas can be misinterpreted and misused. Even Bhagavad Gita can be misinterpreted and misused. Even the scriptures of the Buddhists, the three Pitakas can be misinterpreted and misused. Even the Guru Granth Ji can be misinterpreted and misused. So can be the case with the Quran. Then he says, we need only to go back a couple of dozen of years to the Jim Crow era. Jim Crow. Do you know what is the Jim Crow era? It's not the name of a person. In USA, between 1860 to 1960, it was called the Jim Crow era. Why was it called the Jim Crow era? 1860 to 1960. For 100 years, it was a Jim Crow era. Why? Because for every black American, the white Americans sarcastically called him a Jim. A Jim Crow. He is a Jim Crow. Crow is black. A Jim Crow. So it was a racist slur. It was a racist comment against the blacks. So this author is saying we need only to go back a couple of dozen of years to the Jim Crow era when blacks or African Americans were as a pejorative, as a derogatory referred as Jim Crow and there we can find examples of how today you are talking about Muhammadism and terrorism and Quran. Muslims being terrorists, Islam being a religion of terrorism. Let's just go back between 1860 to 1960. 2001, September 11 happened, na? 1960, 50 years back. And a little 100 years back to that. Let's go to that period to find out how Christianity was shamefully misused and distorted. Then, biblical scripture was routinely cited. Today, according to you, some terrorists are citing the Quran and misinterpreting it during that era Bible numbers 31 were misquoted and always cited for what? to oppress the blacks to kill the blacks to rape them biblical scripture was routinely cited most notably Genesis 9 as the divine basis for racial separation and superiority the most famous famous American terrorist organization, the KKK, which is Ku Klux Klan, the White League or the White Man's League and the Red Shirts. In his article, he only put KKK. I knew about two more organizations, so I added them. The White League or the White Man's League and the Red Shirts, all of whom, now from here, all of whom, again is his article, all of whom were white supremacist paramilitary terrorist groups and they used overtly Christian symbolism and scripture to justify its decade long campaign of violence, murder and intimidation in pursuit of its goals of turning America back into a true Christian nation. So you are talking about Muslims doing it. It happened in America before that. Before September 11, 100 years, already the Bible was being misused, misinterpreted and using a religious scripture, terrorism was being committed on the soil of America by white supremacist groups. Then he says, another paragraph but I have just as I said excerpts, just as for a time, just as for a time period, the KKK was a significant political force in this country, so today, meaning at the time of December 2002, he is saying today, meaning that time when he is writing the article. So today, Al-Qaeda is a political force in the Muslim world and these organizations and not the religions they claim to represent are the actual enemy. Meaning, don't say Islam is an enemy. 
these organizations are an enemy who are misrepresenting their religious scripture and religion. Just as KKK, the white man's league or the red shirts, they misrepresented Bible and Christianity. These organizations that Al-Qaeda, ISIS, lashkar e they are misrepresenting the Islamic scripture Quran and the Seerat of Muhammad Islam. And they may be committing terrorism, but because of that, don't blame the religion. Just like you never blamed Bible and Christianity when KKK, Red Shirts and the White League's man was committing terrorism on American soil. Then he says, historical context must likewise be remembered when judging Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He says, you should study the historical context. He says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa now again, another source. Muhammad Sazam fought only a handful of battles in his lifetime, resulting in barely 1,000 casualties on all sides. Only 1,000 people. And you call him a person who has committed terrorism. This might be compared. Now he's comparing the wars of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Honest person. This might be compared with, with what? With, this might be compared to such biblical figures as David, Dawud Salam, according to the Bible, who is praised in 1 Samuel chapter 18 for killing tens of thousands. According to Bible, Dawud Salam killed tens of thousands. But he is praised. Great, he killed so many of them. Then Moses and Saul also killed thousands. And to Moses, in the book of Numbers chapter 31, he chastises his army. Chastises his army, what does it mean? He commands his army. He makes a point clear to his army and he says, when you attack your enemy, make sure you let their virgin girls remain and their children remain for us. Kill the remaining. But you praise him. To compare Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam to Moses or Jesus or against some contemporary standard is meaningless and anachronistic that is something belonging to a period other than that is actually being portrayed. If you are saying terrorism belongs to Muhammad Sassam, you are portraying something which actually does not reflect original personality of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The world that Moses and Muhammad Sassam lived in was a lawless, lawless and violent, different from even the Roman dominated world in which Jesus lived. Meaning, the time period and the place where Muhammad Sassam and Musa Sallam were living it was so violent, it was so lawless that at least the Romans were civilized compared to the people amongst whom Muhammad Sassam and Musa Sassam used to live. Strong vested interests opposed the monotheism each one of them praised. Strong enemies, they opposed the Tawheed preached by Musa Sassam and Muhammad Sassam. Genocide was a common place. Killing the common masses in bulk in a large number was very common. It was not a crime. Slavery was taken for granted. Women had few rights or no rights. And might and oppression was the only law. This is the time when Muhammad Sassam came. This is the time when the women were looked down upon. And he came to say, whoever brings up his daughters, two daughters, carefully, with love and affection, gets them married at the right time, will be with me in Jannat like this. He, through the Quran, gives them the right to inheritance as a religious right. See, I, as I said, I can keep speaking and speaking and speaking. What makes Muhammad wasallam so important? So the answer to this question, which is the title of my talk is, everything of the life of Muhammad wasallam makes him the most important and he is the one who cannot be compared with anyone because none is equal to that one Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he is only next to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. I would like to conclude my talk with an ayat of the Quran and with a poetic stanza of Sheikh Saadi Rahmatullah Alaihi. Allah said in the Quran, in Surah Sabah, Surah number 34, Ayat number 28, illa bashiran wa naziran, wala kinna aksaran nasi la yalamun. O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we did not send you, but as a messenger to entire humanity, 
to give them glad tidings, to warn them. But unfortunately, most of them do not understand this. And the beautiful poetic stanza of Sheikh Sadi Rahmatullah. Balagal ula bi kamalihi, kashafat duja bi jamalihi, hasunat jami u khisalihi, sallu alayhi wa alihi. What does it mean? Balagal ula bi kamalihi. The status you have gained is with your efforts and your qualities. That status being next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you deserve it because you have strived and you have successfully strived to reach that level to be the next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Balagal ula bi kamalihi, kashafat duja bi jamalihi, all the darkness of ignorance with your beautiful face. You enlightened everybody and you spread the rays of light through the message of the Quran. With your beauty of recitation, with your own beautiful personality, you spread light in the darknesses of all kinds. Kashafat duja bi jamalihi. Hasunat jami o khisalihi. You are exalted in your characters and morals. You are at the zenith of being the best in your morals and characters. Sallu alayhi wa alihi. May peace and salutations of Allah be upon you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhiru dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Muhammadun Rasulullah.